All right, this is about uh, correction of accounting errors. Um, and the first thing to recognize is that these are caused by a transaction that was recorded incorrectly or not correctly, not recorded at all, yet we should have known better at the time. There was information available at that time. Um, in this case, all prior year financial statements that need to be corrected that are that are being presented need to be corrected so you would never there's some, a, a couple of cardinal rules Num number one all financial statements that are presented must be corrected and number two the financial statements and the general ledger must match you can't operate when they're they're not matching today whenever whenever you make the correction it needs to be correct the, the financial statements and the general ledger must be correct today so for <clears throat> we have a number of things that are recorded and reported retrospectively um, most changes in accounting principle so if you go from lifo to fifo or LIFO to average cost, average cost to FIFO, or FIFO to average cost, all of those changes are going to be reported retrospectively. A change in reporting entity for, uh, let's say that we, we consolidate because we acquired a company. We need to go back and treat it as if we have had that company all along if we're going to show consolidated, finan consolidated financial statements. Um, and then we have corrections of errors. So where we know that the, the prior financial statements are wrong, we've got to correct them. And, they, and the key again is always issue correct financial statements going forward, make sure they're correct, and make sure everybody knows that you've made changes to those financial statements. Now there's some things that we do prospectively. For example, if we um, change an estimate, we just make a change the current year's estimate and and it uh, we if it's a significant amount we uh, need to disclose that changes in accounting principle when the retrospective approach is impractical so for example changing to lifo is uh, very difficult to go back backwards and so it's impractical to do that so we only use um, prospective accounting for that Changes in accounting principle when the prospective application is mandated. In those cases, FASB is saying, all right, you need to go forward and we're going to make this change from a, a method that was GAP before to a new method that's GAP. And you can do it prospectively, and they'll tell you that in that transition. Okay, so I, and this just summarizes what I just said. We're going to focus over here in the red about uh, errors. They are always retrospective. So if we should have known better, we need to go back and correct the erroneous financial statements that are produced or were produced, and we need to correct those and issue new financial statements, uh, restating those prior year financial statements. Um, if there is something that occurred before the beginning of the years that are presented, you do a prior period adjustment up until the beginning of that earliest period that's being presented. And uh, we, ha we do need to make an, a, a journal entry. Usually, um, well, if it affects net income, it's going to affect retained earnings. If it affected net income before the first period that's being presented, then it's going to affect um, retained earnings at the beginning of the first period being presented instead of, for example, going into net income because we're not showing net income. It just goes directly into retained earnings. Okay, correction of accounting errors. Um, here are the steps that we need to go through. It's called an um, prior period adjustment, that is where we go back and restate retained earnings uh, by making a correction to a prior period that's not being reported. So before the earliest period that's be reported in our comparative income statements, we're going to go back and correct that. Number one, 
communicate with uh, with all known financial statement users that the old financial statements should not be relied upon. You need to do that right away. And so we need um, to make that, let's see if I can get out of here and put that in there. Go back to my slideshow. Communicate to all known financial statement users. It, for public companies, that means a press release on your website and uh, send it out to the Wall Street Journal or any other uh, news to, uh, organization. Also an 8K, uh, it's a significant news event that needs to be reported with the SEC. Step two, a journal entry is made to correct any account balances that, will, that are incorrect. So we're gonna fix those account the journal general ledger step three we need to uh, revise the prior year financial statements so that they everything that uh, is correct now based upon the information that you have and should have had at the time when you put out the the prior financial statements you, you have this information now and you should have had it earlier that's what's the definition of an error Step number four, if retained earnings is one of the accounts that's incorrect as, as a result of the error, and usually that is, the correction is reported as a prior period adjustment to the beginning balance in the statement of shareholders equity. So we're, we're gonna go back to the beginning balance from of all of the periods that are being presented and make that change. Keep in mind that typically there's going to be an effect on um, kind of an offsetting effect. So if you have a $10 million uh, increase in retained earnings, because um, for example, we should have, um, for, for whatever reason, and the offset was a, a debit to an asset at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the uh, periods that are being reported, it's important to remember that you're gonna have a tax effect on that. And so it may not be 10 million. If it's a 30% tax, it would be only a $7 million credit to um, retained earnings, a $3 million credit to probably deferred tax payable, and a $10 million debit to inventory or whatever the asset is that should be increased, should have been higher at the beginning of the comparative years that are presented. And then you have to do this disclosure note. So we need the correction is reported as a prior period adjustment in step number four. And in step five, we, we put out this disclosure note that as part of the financial statements that describes the nature of the error, what happened, the impact of the correction on each financial statement line item, and importantly, on any per share amounts that are affected. So remember, we, we show on the face of the income statement, earnings per share, basic and diluted, and they, those need to be adjusted. So they're correct and we need to explain that. All right, it's important to remember that if it affected net income in the reporting period, if the error affected a net income in the reporting period when it occurred, and it's not, we didn't figure it out until after the financial statements had been issued, that's when we have a prior period adjustment. That's when we have to go back and restate those financial statements. Um, if it doesn't affect net income, or it's a, uh, it occurs in, a, um, in the current period, we fix the error before it got into the financial statements. That's not nearly as complicated. Um, sometimes there are errors that don't affect net income. Uh, that is something exclusively on the balance sheet. Maybe in this case, um, we recorded it at a $2 million note receivable as an account receivable, and it should have been listed as a note receivable. This is called a reclassification entry, and it's just shifting from one asset to another, uh, accounts receivable to notes receivable. Uh, that's really pretty easy for dealing with, uh, you would still um, need to report it and when when you you're showing the comparative balance sheet last year 
that would have to be corrected. Um, there's no prior period adjustment. That is, there's no adjustment to retained earnings because it didn't affect net income. Um, and you still need that disclosure um, note that explains what the error was. There was no effect on net income. Um, how it affect that it didn't affect income from continuing operations or earnings per share, but you need to disclose that in the in, in the footnote to the financial statements. So here's an example of a, a correction of an accounting error for a, a year one error that was discovered in year three, and we're only presenting two years in this financial statement. So. Um, year one is not being presenting. We're just presenting year two and year three. And what we're saying here is that at the beginning of year two, um, retained earnings at the end of year two, at, at the end of year one was 600,000, but we need to adjust it downward for something that occurred in 2000, in, in year one, um, and that's called a prior period adjustment, so that we get to a corrected opening balance at the beginning of, two th of, of year two of 580,000. And then everything flows forward from that, and that's how it gets reported, a, a prior period adjustment gets, gets reported. Unfortunately, most errors affect net income. And when they affect net income, they also affect the balance sheet. So you have a debit to an expense and a credit to a payable or a whatever, but it's going to affect both of those. We need to retrospectively correct those financial statements, both the income statement and the balance sheet for years that are being presented alongside the current year. This means sometimes the statement of cash flows is affected. Any incorrect balances need to be corrected. There's no excuse for putting out wrong financial statements after you correct it, uh, recognize that there's an error. Sometimes there are ta taxes are affected. If it's a if it's a gap only adjustment, and it would affect deferred income tax uh, asset or liability. Sometimes it affects both gap and tax, and then we have to prepare an amended return. We may have to pay some additional tax if we, and penalty, and we need to disclose that in the financial statements. We need to claim that tax refund, and we need to disclose the effect in the financial statements. Um, and as a liability or a receivable, a tax re refund receivable. So here's, an, here's a question. Which of the following is not true regarding the correction of an error? A, a journal entry is made to correct any account balances that are incorrect as a result of the error. That's absolutely correct. B, prior year financial statements are restated to reflect the correction of the error if the error affected those financial statements. So if we're, we're reporting those uh, prior year financial statements, we need to restate them. The correction is reported prospectively. That's wrong. And so prior financial statements must be revised. And the answer that we're looking for here is C. I know it doesn't line up. I'll try to get that corrected right here. Where's C? We go back to the slide. So there it is. The correction is reported prospective. That, that, that's wrong. The effect of an error is reported as an adjustment to beginning of period retained earnings and prior year financial statements are restated. So every financial statement that's reported gets those income statements get corrected. So here's an example of how an error can flow through the financial statements. 
Early in year three, overseas wholesale supply discovered that a $1 million, that $1 million of inventory had been inadvertently excluded from its year one ending inventory count. Say, for example, they had some inventory out on, on consignment on a piece of, uh, in front of a, a wholesale barn and in Moscow. And they forgot to include that inventory that's on consignment that's out there. It's still ours, overseas wholesale supply company. Um, and we need to in include that, and we should have included it at the end of year one. So ending inventory at the end of year one is understated. The beginning inventory and the purchases for year one, they're fine, but we didn't show enough ending inventory, so we need to increase that. And since ending inventory is subtracted from cost of goods available for sale, the sum of these two, then if we need to increase this because it's understated, well, we're going to have to decrease cost of goods sold because it's overstated. Cost of goods sold is overstated, so net income is going to be understated. And as a result of that, retained earnings, because net income flows into retained earnings, it's also understated. Now, when we do year two, the ending inventory of year one is the beginning inventory of year two. And it's, it was understated at the end of year one, it's also understated at the end of, uh, at, at the beginning of year two, right? We didn't dis discover this until year three. So now beginning inventory is understated. The ending inventory and the purchases, that's all correct. Um, and as a result, ending is uh, ending inventory is understated. Beginning inventory is understated. So our cost of goods available for sale is understated. The ending inventory is not affected. We counted that correctly at the end of year two. And so the cost of goods sold is going to be understated because our cost of goods available for sale is understated. Um, cost of goods sold is understated in the income statement. Um, but, and net income is overstated by exactly the same amount that net income from year one was understated. As a result, these two offset each other when we look at the ending retained earnings balance. It's correct. That's because uh, this understated in net income in year one is exactly offset by the overstated income in year two. So it's early year three, wholesale, uh, overseas wholesale supply discovered that $1 million of inventory had been inadvertently excluded from its year one in ending inventory count. So if the error is discovered in year two, I think that should be, sorry, that should be year, year three. Yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it, it's all right. If it's discovered in year two before closing, then we simply do this journal entry. It's not that simple. We're going to debit inventory at, at the beginning of year two, because this is at the and we're going to credit retained earnings. And so that's going to be our journal entry at the beginning of year two. We're going to debit inventory and credit retained earnings. And then, because it was occurred in year two, if it, and, and as a result of that, if we're looking back, inventory was understated at the end of year one, and if you work through that math, that means that um, net income 
was understated it's because net in inventory would have been higher and cost of goods sold would be lower in year one. But it switches around when we debit inventory at the beginning of year one, at the beginning of year two, and then the ending inventory is correct at the end of year two. So we've got a, a more debits to inventory in year two. And so our cost of goods sold, if nothing, if we didn't do anything, would be overstated in year two, all things considered. If the, there would be no need to correct it if, if the error is dis discovered in year three or later, we wouldn't have to make any correction because by the end of year two, everything is hunky-dory. Yes, we understated net income at the end of year one and overstated net income at the end of year two. But if we are discovering this at the end of sometime in year three, after the financial statements for year two have been issued, we don't actually have to make any changes in year three prior period adjustment because they're exactly going to offset each other from year one to year two. That doesn't mean we don't need to to release corrected income statement and balance sheet. It just means that by the time that we do our year three financial statements, our books, our general ledger, is going to match up correctly with the financial statements. So we don't actually need to make any change there. Now, in, year, at the, in early year three, they discover this had been inadvertently excluded from its year one ending inventory. So we need to now, if it's year two, we need to go back and retrospectively correct year one financial statements. That is, uh, inventory should have been higher, uh, cost of goods sold should have been um, lower as a result of the higher inventory and net income would have been higher and probably taxes would have been higher too. If the error is discovered in year three, we have to retrospectively correct both year one and year two financial statements to increase income in year one and decrease in income in year two, but we don't need to do anything to our our general ledger or our journal entries because those errors washed each other out by the time we got to year three. Step three, year two beginning retained earnings balance needs to be correct at the end at the beginning of year two. So now we're looking at this and we're going to issue these financial statements for year two and we want to make sure that our beginning retained earnings balance is correct. If it's not correct, we need to make a prior period adjustment. And that involves another balance sheet account, typically inventory or whatever it is that's, that needs to be adjusted at the beginning of year two. And the offsetting amount is going to be to retained earnings as what's called a prior period adjustment. And then we have to put a disclosure note in the annual report and saying what the nature of the error is and the impact of this correction on each year's net income. How did this affect year one income, year two income, year three income, and that is income from continuing operations, which is essentially net income, and earnings per share. And if we do two levels, two types of earnings per share would have to be both of them. Now, in year three, uh, this is a new example. General paper discovers that 3,000 of merchandise sold on credit the last week of year two was not recorded until the first week of year three. So it was sold in year two, but we didn't record it in, as a sale until year three. Um, we 
the inventory was not included in the year two ending inventory, but as it should have been. So that means that cost of goods sold reflected that sale, but the revenue did not. And so for year two, we should have done this in year two, debit accounts receivable and credit sales for three, and there would have been no entry. What we did was we didn't make an entry for that sale in year two, and we should have, and we debited accounts receivable and credited sales in year three. Now, in year three, how are we going to deal with this to correct this incorrect? It, uh, we discovered that 3,000 of sales at the last week of year two were not recorded until the first week of year three. The merchandise was sold was appropriately excluded. So what we need to do is um, do a prior period adjustment. That is, we're going to debit sales revenue from year three because it was overstated in year three and credit retained earnings uh, to reflect the increased revenue at the end of year two that should have been reported. When we issue our financial statements, those financial statements should reflect higher and we show the comparative from two to three uh, that sales should go into year two and not into year three. Um, so we have to retrospectively restate those financial statements, tell everybody that we made a mistake, we get sued, we understand that that's a cost of doing business. People make mistakes. In step three, because retained earnings is one of the accounts that's incorrect as a result of the error, the correction to that account is reported as a prior period adjustment at the beginning, at the top of the statement of stockholders equity, which typically includes a column for retained earnings. If they do a separate statement of retained earnings, I rarely see that, but if they do one of those, you would put it at the beginning of the error. And then we have to add the, the disclosure note saying, what was the error? Uh, how did fixing it affect the financial statement line items? And in particular, um, uh, net income and uh, any earnings per share numbers. Here's an example from, I believe it's Hertz, if I recall. Yeah, Hertz, during the fourth quarter. And, and, and the key here is that during the fourth quarter of 2013, they identified certain of these misstatements totaling 46 million, of which 35 million, 21 million net of tax. So remember, they're, um, they're showing this tax effect related to previously issued consolidated financial statements for the year ended 12-31-12 and prior. While these misstatements did not individually or in, ag in the aggregate result in a material misstatement of the company's uh, previously issued consolidated financial statements, correcting those misstatements in the fourth quarter of 2013 would have been material to that year. So sometimes the error doesn't have, is not, it's an accumulation of errors across time. But if we don't do a prior period adjustment, that adjustment this year becomes material in this year. And, and that's what happened here. And that if we had made that all of that adjustment in 2013, in that fourth quarter, that would have been material. As a result of that, we're issuing uh, restated financial statements, going back and, and doing a prior period adjustment, and then they talk about what happened there. So errors affecting net income, recording asset as an expense. In this one, in year four, it was discovered that Heinz 55 had debited the expense for the full cost of an asset purchased January 1, year one. The cost was 24 million with no expected residual value. So they debited an expense, but it it has a useful life of five years. The straight line would have been appropriate. The correcting journal entry, assuming the error was discovered in, in year four before the adjusting and closing entries, includes... Um, so by the end of year... By the end of year three, 
If it was discovered in year four, we would just correct depreciation expense for year four. But year three, at the begin, end of year three, we should have had accumulated depreciation for three years, all of one, all of two, and all of three. And if we take the 24 million divided by five, 20 million divided by four, five is four million, and four million divided by five is 800. So 4.8 4 million. We should have had 4.8 for year one, 4.8 for year two, and 4.8 for year three of debit to depreciation expense and a credit to accumulated depreciation. So three times 4.8, three times four is 12, and three times 0.8 is 2.4. So that's 12 plus 2.4, 14.4. We, we need a credit to accumulated depreciation for 14.4 million at the beginning of year four. Global Products overstated its inventory by 30 million at the end of year one. The discovery of this error during year two before adjusting and closing entries would require, so they overstated their inventory at the end of year one, um, we, we haven't put out erroneous financial statements yet. Before, oh, the discovery, during year two, before the adjusting and closing entries for year two. So we have put out bad financial statements for, for year one. Um, debiting inventory would have increased the overstatement. It's already overstated by 30 million. I don't think A is going to be correct. A prospective adjustment. Now, this is an error. It needs to be corrected retrospectively. An increase to retain earning? No, when you have an, a, your inventory is overstated, um, think of it this way. What's the offsetting credit? Well, it's going to be a credit to retained earnings. Uh, net income was overstated also. We do not want to increase retained earnings. Instead, the answer is none of the above. Um, retained earnings would be debited and inventory would be credited. And neither of those things was an option in the multiple choice question. All right, in summary, um, we talked about uh, changes in accounting principle. Most of those are retrospective. There's some exceptions. We have changes in estimate, which is not a very big deal. We handle that prospective. And if it's a really large amount, then we have a disclosure note. We note that changes in reporting entity from, say, consolidated to equity method or vice versa, um, they are handled respect retrospectively. And um, that involves an adjustment to retained earnings as well, similar to uh, an error correction, really, just like this. In error corrections, it's always retrospective. We ha always have to restate the prior years um, that are being shown alongside the, uh, our existing financial statements. And if they're not being sh shown alongside, but we think people are still relying on them, we have to issue those, those correct financial statements. Um, and yes, we need a, a, a journal entry to correct the books. Always issue correct financial statements. Make sure they're correct. And number two, by the end the, uh, today, the, uh, the day that you make the correction, the general ledger should correspond to uh, the correct amounts. You shouldn't carry an error in your general ledger after today. And that may mean making it, uh, for example, um, a prior period adjustment. And that's all I have about accounting errors.